We come together this afternoon to accept the invitation of Jesus Christ when he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. We come together this afternoon to find our hope in God amidst the storm. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. And again in Psalm 121, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Therefore, we come together this afternoon to thank God for his loving concern for troubled souls and to remember the shortened but full life of Jeff Robinson, to share our grief and to commend him to the eternal care of God. Please pray with me. God of all mercies, you make nothing in vain and you love all that you have made. Heal us in our grief and console us by the knowledge of your unfailing love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We're going to play two songs. Please feel free to, to sing along with us. Softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals, he's waiting and watching, watching for you.
Most of you don't know this, but Jeff spent a lot of his 20s writing. He wrote poems mostly and performed them around town in New Orleans and at a house in Pensacola, Florida called Mystic Garage, a place he co-founded and called home, a place that welcomed artists, writers, musicians, and anyone with a creative soul. Jeff showed me his poems and writings early on but I didn't really understand the importance of them or the impact he made by writing them until now, as memories and stories pour in from old friends. He showed me his recipes early on too, which were really just lists of ingredients under headers like gumbo or duck terrine. He started cooking in restaurants in his late teens. He didn't go to culinary school. Cooking was just in his blood. He loved cookbooks and would read them cover to cover, then rarely return to them. His memory for ingredients and proportions was astounding. He loved cooking. <clears throat> Jeff also loved music. It was one of our first bonding moments, sitting in his tiny apartment when we first met, listening to music, talking about why a song moved us so. This last year, music is what engaged him. In that rehabilitation center, 
and during hospital visits at our church through his iPod while receiving radiation in our home and as he lay dying in our living room. It was music that brought him to the surface. Other loves that made up Jeff's life were animals and bicycles, organic gardening, and eating and canning from our gardens. He loved poetry and books, and he loved people. If you touched his heart, you were planted there for eternity. He was loyal. He was funny. He was the sweetest and the gentlest man I have ever known. Jeff's old friend from his writing days, Jamie Jones, a writer and teacher in Pensacola, woke up the morning of Jeff's passing and wrote a poem for him. Jamie didn't sit down to write about Jeff, but in his note to me, he said, Jeff was strongly on my mind, and the poem quickly became about and for him, became his, and obviously became a prayer. I think all poems are prayers, but this one seems more obviously so. I felt him so strongly. He was very present and still is. This poem pushed its way through and I was grateful to help it come about. Jamie sent me the poem around noon on the day Jeff left this world for the next, and here it is. November 1, 2014, for Jeff Robinson. We sink into neighborhoods, shut down the churches on Halloween, and bring the kids back into the streets. The veil is thin, of course. The course is unraveling, leading to continuous lines. In the dark, these flicker. Sunshine, cold leaf patterns, like moving water. I am moving water. I talk out of two sides of my face. Sometimes I am noble, other times clearly out of line, other times moving water. I am noble flick of sunlight, moving leaf dance, gene click. I am you when you are unaware the truest fall we've ever had. Fall upon us now, cool Kerouac, click of timely ohm thought. Heaven in mourning, I pray. You into the sky, I pray. You, noble to heaven, I pray. Smooth the way of this sad and beautiful Halloween of heaven in thee. You as a restive psalm, you as a light arriving. I send my heart to you in light arriving that I may not talk out of two sides of my face that you may not be fearful, but cool, joyous, holy, that you may feel holy silence of this non-talking, faceless state. I am your friend, seeing you in golden strands. I am all light waves today, leaf dance, moving water, shadow shifts. I am a dark Christian, let loose on Halloween streets, thinking my friend to heaven. I am a noble light wave mess whose leaf shimmer heart moves continuous through you with hope to see you through. When Jamie wrote this, he didn't know that Jeff had passed earlier that same morning. See, I looked up. I wasn't supposed to look up. <laughs> uh, it's so beautiful. It just leaves me speechless. Jeff came to me a little bit broken, but still with spirit. I was a little bit broken, too. We both felt strongly that we were meant to be together, that God had brought us to each other for a purpose. Jeff wasn't so sure about God in the beginning, <laughs> but I knew. The first time I hugged Jeff, I was shocked to discover that after knowing him for just a few hours, I felt love for him. That electrified, bewildered feeling has never worn off. While in rehab for alcohol addiction, Jeff became a Christian and he wrote to me, thank you for helping me come to the word and teaching of Jesus, for looking past all the BS and harm I had in my life. I look forward to a life with you and all the paths we have yet to walk down. There are too many things that click between us that makes everything just fit right. I don't think there was a better time for us to find each other. 
Neither Jeff nor I expected our lives to include marriage, but here we were ready to marry each other. He fashioned the ring with our jeweler friend, Julie, and we married on the beautiful Craftsman restaurant patio on a crisp fall evening. We honeymooned in Ashland, Savannah, Pensacola, New Orleans, Memphis. In our two short time together, we spent a lot of time recovering. Recovering from the deaths of our pets, recovering from the effects of, and in Jeff's case, addiction to alcohol, recovering from childhood traumas, old wounds, and self-inflicted pains, recovering from emergency brain surgery, recovering from brain trauma, recovering from radiation, and working hard to recover from cancer. We also spent so much time dreaming and laughing and working in the garden and in the kitchen, building bookshelves and greenhouses, biking and picnicking, road tripping all over the south and all over the east. I am realizing now that even though we did a great deal of lazing about, we lived a lifetime in our five years and four months together. Jeff didn't write much after he moved to Minneapolis some 20 years ago. He focused on cooking and performed every station from line cook to chef between the dozen or so restaurant kitchens he worked in. One of the hardest things of the last few months has been watching Jeff's skill become lost and feeling the accompanying sorrow that this memory gap created. He lost a lot of himself to cancer and to the relentless artillery of treatments he underwent. Toward the end, he grew sad as his spirit and his body was just worn out from it all. But just the other day, I found this entry from Jeff, written in March of this year. This morning starts all right. It is tough to live one's life with cancer. My pain comes through sometimes, but I don't let it take me on. I have to move on. I can't let it drive me down. That is the Jeff we know, the Jeff we love. Resilient, easygoing, facing the day head on. No bitterness, no blame, no sorrow. I am so comforted that he opened his heart to Jesus. I am so comforted that he is no longer in any pain. No more headaches. No more nausea, no more funky taste buds, no more sadness, no more frustration, no more telling me I'm sorry for getting cancer even though he never needed to. I imagine the great reunion he's having with his mama and his daddy. I imagine him gardening, pricking, picking fresh herbs, cooking. I imagine him rolling in the tall grass with his dogs and cuddling his cats. I imagine him at Heaven's Braza, eating his favorite food. I imagine him biking down smooth, tree-shadowed paths on a perfect summer day. I imagine him gazing out at his beloved Pensacola Beach. Hey, Marty. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Carl George, and I attend Hiawatha Church here. And I've had the privilege and the honor of knowing Jeff and Marty this past year. And I was able to attend a community group Bible study with Jeff uh, last year that met every Monday uh, for nine months. And I felt uh, very grateful to get to know him and uh, the men that were in there much, much more. That was truly a blessing to us. I was trying to think of what to say today. There are an infinite number of things to talk about when talking about Jeff. And I thought I would focus on three things. And the three things are, he sounded cool. He did cool things. He said even cooler things. So for the first one, he sounded cool. Did you guys ever just talk to Jeff and you were listening 
she kind of zoned out a little bit because you said to yourself, man, this guy sounds cool. He kind of talks like Matthew McConaughey, but way cooler. And sometimes I don't always make sense when I talk to people, and maybe I was uh, saying something to Jeff in my head thinking, that didn't make sense at all. And he would just look at me, kind of nod his head and say, all right, brother. <laughs> but way cooler than that, 20 times cooler. The second thing is, he did cool things. Uh, I think most of you know um, that he had a talent for cooking, and to be in the kitchen, and he was a master chef, and um, I cook a little bit, but I got to carpool with him a number of times and ask him questions and pick his brain about this and about that. And he got to tell me um, what herbs to use and spices and uh, a lot of things I didn't know about. And I just learned recently that one of his favorite herbs to use was thyme, um, T-H-Y-M-E. I just say that because I actually didn't know how to spell that. And I didn't know much about thyme, so I thought I would look it up and see what it was all about. And what I found was this, that the ancient Egyptians used time for embalming. The ancient Greeks used it believing it was a source of courage. The Romans used it to purify their rooms and to give an aromatic flavor. In the European Middle Ages, the herb was placed beneath pillows to aid sleep and ward off nightmares. Time was also used as an incense and placed on coffins during funerals as it was supposed to assure passage into the next life. In more than one way, I feel like this herb is very fitting for Jeff. But it also made me think how this herb reflects the gospel. God fills us with courage. He is the aromatic flavor that gives us life. He wards off our nightmares, and he, through his son, Jesus Christ, assures us passage into the next life. With that said, it brings me to my final point. He sounded cool, he said cool things, he said he did cool things, he said even cooler things. God was working in Jeff. That was apparent, that was apparent to me, to Marty, to all of us here, to the men in the community group. That was very conspicuous. In our Monday night meetings, for an hour and a half to two hours, Jeff wouldn't always speak. And when he did, he he wouldn't always say a lot, but when he spoke, Marty, we listened. We really listened. That's because when he spoke, his words did not meet our ears like the sound of a trumpet, but as a whisper. But it was in those whispers that his Christ-like words resonated in our hearts as if God's multitude of angels were blowing their finest trumpets. 1 Kings 19, 11 to 13, in a paraphrase, states this. The Lord spoke to the prophet Elijah, saying that the Lord was not in the wind. The Lord was not in the earthquake. The Lord was not in the fire. But the Lord was in the sound of a low whisper. At times, God will speak to us in whispers, and if we listen, we just might be able to hear it. Jeff spoke God's word in whispers, and I'll always be grateful that I listened and I heard it. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, God. Amen. such an awesome photo. I just keep staring at it. Um, I'm Jeff. I'm an old, old friend of Marty's. Um, I'd much rather watch her on a stage than have her watching me. Tonight included, that was incredible. She sent me that eulogy and she was like, is there anything I should change? Anything I should do? And I wrote back and I was like, oh, it's perfect. She was like, really? I was like, how do you change that? Like, it's an amazing... And just a quick thank you to you, Marty. Um, and I think I feel fairly confident I speak for everybody in this room. Like your ability to sort of hold our hands as we went through, as you went through this journey, as people tried and, you know, to some degrees succeeded or failed to hold yours and support you. Like your ability to kind of reach out and support your wider community and bring them closer is 
truly incredible. Like, I've never experienced anything like it, so thank you. <laughs> um, I don't have a lot of memories that are just mine of Jeff. A lot of my memories are Jeff and Marty or filtered through Marty, um, but I have a couple that, for whatever reason, kind of stick together, and we'll see if I can actually give them any sort of meaning by talking here. But uh, the last time that we really hung out in a kind of a normal way, you came over for dinner with Jeff, and, uh, and Marty had just gotten this, like, this box out of the alley with a super crazy latch, like a latch like you've never seen before, like a mystery latch, like, a, like some sort of riddle for monkeys like me. Like, let, put, put Jeff in the room alone with that box for an hour and let's see if he can open it. And, 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 <laughs> and your Jeff, uh, felt the same way. He was like, yeah, you got to see this, you know. And so you and Laurel went to the back, and Jeff took me to the car and opened the hatch, and we sat there and just, like, stared at this box. And, and like, I would reach out and fiddle with the latch a little bit, and then he would reach out and fiddle with the latch, and we were like, we were like two um, giant bearded newborn babies <laughs> trying to make sense of, like, the shapes right in front of us. And then we finally got it open and we just opened the box and it was just like this collective, like the two of us were just like, whoa, that's how that works? That's a, wow. And I feel like um, my memories of Jeff and of interacting with Jeff from the first time I met him were a lot around just kind of a mutual, sort of quiet, like, oh yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Um, and the memory that sort of, uh, is sort of glued to that for me for whatever reason was um, the last time that I saw him alive um, when we were at your house and I shared this elsewhere but I'm gonna share it here uh, and he was he was awake he was talking um, Marty was really excited about that come over he's awake and talking I really want you to just get a chance to see him and um, and we got there we showed up and he was he was awake he was chatting he was um, I mean chatting he was he was speaking, he was communicating with us. There were words, there were gestures, the gestures were somehow funnier than the words and just as intentional. Um, but after a little while of him really kind of making us cry, I remember telling him, I read a story about you used to be called Jeff who can't play guitar. And, uh, and this was the thing he used to do, where like he was Jeff who can't play guitar and he would get on stage and not play good guitar, which is a really funny bit to me. And, and I was telling him about that and I was like, so you can't play guitar, that's a, you know, it's a beautiful story. It's a little sad story too. And he hadn't done much in the last couple minutes and he just looked at us and he went. <laughs> like this, and then we all like cracking up and you could tell he was just like feeling that and feeding on that. And then for the next like five or 10 minutes, there was a lot of that. These just like really, really funny sort of almost physical comedy moments with him. And then he started to get kind of frustrated. Um, he was. He wanted water and the sponge wasn't any good and the straw wasn't working, it just wouldn't stay in and Marty was doing her best to like make this work. And, uh, and he was getting agitated. And, and Marty said, oh, can I, put on, can I put on some music for you? How about I put on some, some Steve Earle? She said, right, and that what he said? And um, I love Steve Earle. Steve Earle is something that Jeff and I in the past when kind of going over at our first meetings, our list of music that is awesome, was one of the things you would kind of go like, oh yeah, yeah, no, that's good. Good. Memphis, New Orleans, Steve Earle, Lucinda Williams. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we can do this. Um, and so she put this music on, and it was crazy because you had already told me that when it, whenever Steve Earle would come on over the last week, there'd be kind of like a yeah, you know. And and it happened. Like this music came on and and like affected him so profoundly that it just like he he just kind of like I think I said he sunk into himself, which would have a, a little bit in two different ways, first in the music, and then he kind of just went away from us a little bit, you know? Um, but there was one amazing moment, because it was like this Steve Earle mix, and, and not all Steve Earle songs are created equal, and this song came on called Oxycontin Blues, which is about how much addiction sucks, right? But it's also like a really intense and at sometimes kind of funny song. But it has this beginning like mean banjo uh, to it that like every time I listen to it, and I've been listening to this song for, I've been on a kick of this album for weeks, I just get kind of like, my face kind of gets intense, like it's the banjo from Oxycontin Blues. And this came on and I felt that happen to me and I just got a little bit transported, but then I looked at Jeff and he was doing the same thing. And he was just like looking at me and we were like looking at each other like fucking banjo, man. That's amazing. And, uh, and it was like this just incredible 
It's just an incredible connection. And I, I didn't think of the box initially, and maybe I'm just ridiculous for thinking of the box, but like that, that is how I think of Jeff, as someone who is just like a person who experiences wonder quietly. I am a person who experiences wonder very loudly. Um, and so I, I really, uh, I loved that in him, it was amazing. Um, and then just to say a, a little bit about the kind of memory of Marty and Jeff together as a kind of unit, I was just amazed, and having known Marty for such a long time, at how, from the very first time I spent time with them, whether I was sitting at a table, like at a restaurant, or sitting at my dining room table with them, or at your dining room table, it was so comfortable. Like, you guys were so comfortable with each other, and it was so comfortable being with you. It was like, it was just like Jeff's big, shaggy, layered, soft clothes. It was just like, that is, that was like the perfect symbol of what he was and what you guys were. And you were, you're such like a, I mean, we're and are such an inspiring like life force together um, throughout all of these phases, before all of this happened. Your wedding was amazing. You're like, I don't know if you've ever heard kids talk about Minecraft, but that's how I think of their house. Like, you remember like the Facebook post? Like, we built a greenhouse. We built a garden in the front. You know, like we shaved off the roof and built a watchtower and a beacon. Like, it's just like, <laughs> it was crazy. And there was this moment of like, I had been going in and out of that house for like 20 years or something. And I was just like, what's happening over there? Um, and, and that feeling of just like, that just natural, comfortable feeling, I just couldn't believe how you maintained it throughout all that had happened and through that last week of his life and in those days after he had passed when he was there with us still, his body was there with us still, it just, it changed me forever. So thank you and thank you to this guy too, um, who was, I used to call myself the real Jeff because I'm Jeff, I'm actually Jeff Stephen Gunsel and he's Stephen Jeffrey. I have a brother named Frank and all of that, but like when I found out he was Jeffrey in the middle, I used to call him the real Jeff, but now I call myself, I call myself the real Jeff. Now I call myself the lesser Jeff. He is amazing. So thank you, Marty, and thank you, Jeff, for, my God, amazing. David played and it pleased the Lord and nothing beats the sound of music to you. It goes like this, a fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, the baffle king composing hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof, forever searching for the truth, the beauty.
frightened and we're hopeful too and we have nothing more to do we're lost and broken looking for we do yet in our grief you make us strong you fill our heart with good and soul Well, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we're here today to impart, remember, and celebrate the life of a loved family member and a friend, to share our grief, uh, but also to hold fast to something, and that is this, to God's promises to us amidst death. And so I want to briefly address three things today that we can and, and really should affirm any time, but maybe especially in times of mourning and sorrow like today. And the first pertains to Jeff more uh, specifically, and it is that Jeff was created in the image of God, and as a Christian was loved by him specially, and was recreated in the particular image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. So this means that as a human being in general, and as a Christian in particular, like a child resembles his father, he resembled God, albeit very imperfectly, like the rest of us who believe in Jesus, but nonetheless intentionally, by design, by divine design. So everything from being able to cook really well, which has come up a lot today already, uh, in, for good reason, everything from being able to cook really good food all the time that many of us had the privilege of eating at, at many times, uh, to his ability to, as Marty has said to me on various occasions throughout the time that I've known Jeff and Marty, to his ability to console and comfort her like no other. Both those things are a gift from God given to Jeff and to us through him, to help us understand something more about God, as if they were hints of divine grace or clues in the master painting of the skill and character of the artist himself. So, for example, with the food and consolation ideas in mind, we read in the Bible that Jesus also was a master at preparing food and a master at consoling people as well. So as we read in John 6, for example, uh, he prepared a much better food. And when he talks about food a lot of times in the Bible, he's talking about himself. He multiplies bread, he multiplies fish, he cares for people's physical hunger, but he primarily cares about the body that is, the bread that is his body being given to the masses. John 6 says, the bread of God is he, speaking of himself, is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Whoever comes to me shall never hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never again thirst. God is also called the great comforter and consoler biblically. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So these aspects of Jeff's life and the many other things that everyone up here was uh, mentioning, Marty and uh, Carl, and Jeff were mentioning 
uh, are worthy of remembrance and celebration on the one hand, but also simultaneously deep gratitude as well, when we remember that they were ultimately gifts given to us by God, in whose image Jeff lived, moved, cooked, comforted, laughed, and otherwise had his being. The second affirmation is this, God is not aloof to death. It's not something that he skirts around or treats as taboo. Rather, he tackles it head on. He talks a lot about it, and more than that, he experiences it. He addresses it. He considers it an enemy, something brought into the world when Adam and Eve, our first parents, rebelled against him and us with them. And so in one sense, death is something very unnatural, something that should sting us deeply, something we should grieve over heavily, yet something we should not be paralyzed in fear over either because of this one great fact. God himself experienced it, and he overcame it. Jesus, the Son of God, after suffering on a cross for the sins of the world 2,000 years ago, actually died and actually resurrected himself in the body. Acts 2.24 says, God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. But the news gets even better when we understand that he did all of that, not just for his glory and his Father's glory, but for us who would benefit from it. Jesus now rules over death, holding, the Bible says, its keys in his hands so that we might affirm that he lets people escape from it just like he did. This is why the Bible talks so much about death being like sleep as well. It's only temporary. It's not eternal. Eventually, we wake up because of how decisively Jesus destroyed it and will destroy it again for us in the future. As he says elsewhere in John 11, even though we die, if we trust in him, yet shall we live. And the final affirmation, the third, is that those who believe in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of their sins, like Jeff did, have as part of their future hope a new earth. So our hope is not speculative, and our hope is not overly spiritual, as if that were possible. Our home is not heaven, though heaven's a great place. Our home is not heaven, and in the clouds like disembodied spiritual existence. If that were the case, death would still, in a way, win. Rather, the Christian hope is very concrete and earthly and bound up with the hope of an actual bodily resurrection. Revelation 21, one of the last two chapters in the entire Bible, says, In reference to the future, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God to a new earth, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. So in this, our hope for Jeff is, and this is a greater hope for all of us who remain, our hope for Jeff is that Jesus will return to earth, he'll bring heaven here, He'll miraculously reassemble his people's actual physical bodies, reunite their souls with them, glorify them, perfect them, and walk with his people on a new earth without pain, shame, tears, or death anymore forever. That's hope amidst the sting of death. Jeff will walk this earth again. It's an earth that he loved very much. But it will be...